<coughs> Hello to everyone. Hope you're all well. So let's get down to business. I've been consistent, haven't I? Even though I'm living sick, eh? Okay. Let's get to this. You've asked me about Danny Karam, DK. You've asked me about my cousin Sam. And you have asked me about the prisons generation back then days to now. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about, first talk about the jails. The jail back then, I first went to jail in 2003. And it was a different prison back then. All right, we're in 2000, what are we in now, 21? It was just a different type of generation, different type of prison rules different type of people and I'll tell you now about that when you used to get to silver water back in my days they never used to ask you now in the new generation excuse me they split you up and they keep you all segregated and yeah but when I first went to jail you get the silver water if for whatever reason, the system already knows you're battling with another crew. They might keep you in a different pod, but you'd be in the same jail, so you'd catch each other, go to a visit, or go to the Oval. So they'd segregate you in the unit, but not in the jail. See, now they just put you in completely different jails. Your visitors, visitors can't bump into each other. You can't see them on the visit. Completely different jails. <laughs> Back in my day, if they had wind that, say you get, I'll tell you an example, I've got the silver, intake comes in, they don't even ask you who you with, what's your story, who you at war with. See, now they do. When you get to the ask you who you at war with, who you, who you with, all these stupid fucking questions. <coughs> anyway, you used to get to silver water, and they, they'll just say to you, what crew are you with? You just sit like that. I swear to God, you sit like that, just look at them. You wouldn't say nothing. You wouldn't say what crew you with. No, these days, it's permitted. You tell them what crew you with, so you go to your boys because you want to hang out with your boys. In my day, you don't talk to the officers. There's no, I've got drums this crew, I've got drums that crew, I'm a part of this gang. No, you just sit like that, all right? I'll tell you a few scenarios. Anyway, I get the silver water, get off the truck, I'll give you an example. Management, call you in, make a phone call to your family. They ask you a question, who you, who you align to? You go, I used to go like to, I swear on my mother's grave. They're like, what? And I'm like, and they're like, oh yeah, we see. You're, you're one of them guys, one of those problematic prisoners. And I'm like, I was young. I was just sticking my finger up to them. Anyway, if I can, you get to a, a unit and you know that your enemy's there in another unit and you know you're going to get him going to the oval, going to a visit, and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. So that's that. Let's take you fast track to a unit in the old days, not the 80s, I'm talking about the early 2000s, I'm talking my, my generation. All the unit, everyone's very serious. No one's a funny cunt, no one's joking around. I, I used to joke around a lot, I just couldn't help myself. I'll tell you straight up, but they're all relatively Serious fucking serious guys. <clears throat> I remember my cousin Mick walked up to me and me, Don't be a fucking idiot. Don't be joking around about it. And my words were to Mick, Don't worry about me, bro. I'll back myself up. If some cut's got a problem, I'll fucking stab him. You just worry about yourself. He's like laughing because they don't cause trouble. So, you know, I was just clowning clown around here and there. I didn't really give a fuck. A lot of boys didn't like it. They just thought I was loud. They test the water. I have a crack of them. And fucking from there on, they knew, Oh, yeah, he's, he's a fucking. Clowns around, but he'll fucking go on with it any day of the week. But this is the difference between then and now. So we're eating, yeah? And Joe blows on that table, Joe blows on that table, Joe blows on that table. Walk past, whoever walks past got a plum with one of these guys. He wouldn't yell out to the boys, he's a fucking dog, give up, get him out of the unit. Because in my day, you couldn't call someone a dog unless you had paperwork. So if you had paperwork, you could call someone a dog. 
But if you had no paperwork, you've got seven days to provide it. If you don't provide it, you're gone. So no one can walk past units and say, like if you've got a problem with someone, you walk past and you're quietly allowed to say, we come here. So when I fucking see on the oval, you're fucking gone, cunt. There's nothing you screaming out and sending word, oh, he's a dog, and give up. These days, cunts, you're like, he's a fucking dog through the fence. So the boys can chump him, get him out of there, because that person probably doesn't want to fucking confront this guy. So he gets them to do his dirty work. And if it's one credible guy putting another guy on a dog, he's more credible than that guy. Even if there's no paperwork, they believe it this fucking day and age. In my fucking day, I didn't give a fuck who it was. You could be King Kong. You tell me he's a dog. I say fucking provide paperwork. If you don't provide paperwork, you've got seven days. That cunt's going to kick it on with you. If he doesn't kick it on with you, then he's a fucking dog. So this is a generation that I was dealing with. See, a few times you'd be eaten. And I don't care who you are, where you come from, what generation. I would never watch my cousin fight or my brother fight. So I struggled in the sense... I never got used to the old mentality jail heads. I tell you an example. My brother once was sitting there, finished. I think on the train on the gym. I think my brother was the hairdresser. I can't remember the scenario, vaguely, but I do remember the drama because it escalated. And then later on, we're like, "What the fuck did it start over?" And I heard like my brother first said it was because the haircut. Then the other guy goes, "No, nah, he wasn't angry at that. He was angry with what you said to him when he was on the oval." And anyway, we've come back, and this fucking. Dumb cunt, I call him a dumb cunt because he actually thought no, I'd let my brother go one-on-one. -on -one. But I tell you the mentality, the whole jail was fucking dirty on me because I jumped in it. Like, it didn't sit well with no one. See the mentality? One-on-ones, one one-on-one, doesn't matter what gang you with, what crew you with. You, you smack it out and you leave it at that knife on knife or fist on fist, whatever you decide. But I had that mentality not because I was a weak person or anything. I just can't let my brother fight one-on-one. -on -one. Simple as fucking that. Or my cousin. I'll let one of the boys have a crack, but when it's blood, it's, it ever tells you this saying, you're, you, you feel the same for your friend as your brother. Your brother and your cousin is your blood. You've been there since fucking childhood. It's none of this bullshit. Like if, we've had members before, but I remember, so he wants to have a go with this bloke. I said, go one-on-one, -on -one. smack it up. I can't do that with my brother or my cousin. I couldn't do that back then. And I still can't do that. It's just it's something I can never do. If I love someone from all my heart, I'll move them all the way. You want to fight them, you fight on me. So long story short, <clears throat> this fucking dumb cunt thought he was a mad cunt. I challenged my brother to a fucking fight. My brother straight away said, yeah, sweet, let's go. Bang, I jumped straight up. Everyone looked at me like, where the fuck's he going? I had a knife fucking like that. I swear to you, I used to carry it. You can see it sticking out of my shirt. Everyone knows I'll stab the fuck out of any cunt gets in my way. It's a different mentality. I was young, in my prime. Didn't give a fuck about no cunt. Bang, jump straight up. That cunt looked at me, looked at all the boys around the table. You thought, oh no, he's not gonna fucking get into it. Fuck, and what? Jump straight up, my brother knew, no matter what, I'm going in there. Even if the whole unit was gonna get involved, I'm going into that cell. Anyway, they fucking went in. Before anything could even happen, I ran in there and fucking pumped this cunt. Me and brother just stomped on him. I fucking just, yeah, chopped the fuck out of this bloke. Battered him so bad, no one even tried to come and intervene because it was get that fucking it was full on. I had him in the cell, fucked him up. You know, I'm only gonna get into what I did to this bloke. Just mangled the fuck out of him. Come out of the unit, they've locked down the jail. I've gone to Segro, I've got back out a few months later. Keep in mind, I've done years in jail. So when you hear me say a story, I went to Segro so many times for fucking months. I was in jail for fucking years, mate. It wasn't like two, three years, it was a fucking long time. So anyway, I went to, to Sagra for three months, came back out, heard whispers, people pissed off for me. When I was walking to the visit, you could feel the tension. Boys are waving at me like, like they're like, dirty that I jumped, oh mate. <laughs> anyway, everyone wasn't dirty. My brother, because my brother, the funny cunt, I don't know why, he just, he was like, I don't know if he really meant it or not, but he was dirty that I jumped in it anyway. So everyone was like, oh, Simon, it's not Simon's fault. He's just, his brother's a fucking shit cunt. One need his brother fight one on one. So anyway, long story short, Wally Armoured, God rest his soul. <laughs> he tried to talk to me a few times. He's like, brother, you can't, even with the a Arab accent. And he's got like Abraham tattoo on his hand. He's got the love heart with the A. He's got, he had on his um, forearm, local Sam Abraham boy. So he was with us all the way back, back in them days. Later on, he ended up doing his own thing before he died. But in that prime, he was, 
He was even in jail on a murder blue with my cousin Sam. They were both on the same murder blue. So anyway, he had a lot of pull, <coughs> a lot of pull in the jail too, because he comes from a big family himself, which are the Armored family. They're pretty big, They're very well known, very respected family. So he had his own fucking power in the jail besides being aligned to us. So anyway, he tried even say to me, brother, you can't. I said, listen, bro, you gonna watch your brother fight? And he scratched his head like that. He goes, bite his finger. <laughs> he used to bite his finger. <laughs> He's like, uh, and I go, bro, you're going to watch your brother fight. I go, if one of your brothers comes in now, you're going to watch him fight. He goes, I understand. I go, bro, it's just fucking unfortunate. Me and my brother in the same unit. There's going to be drama every time someone's fighting brother. I'm going to fuck Nick or more. Nick or means fuck their mother. So anyway, a lot of fucking boys were upset with me that I wouldn't let my brother fight. It was always one-on-ones with everyone else. The boys wouldn't have a go, but if it was my brother or my cousin... I wouldn't allow, even Wally, I wouldn't allow Wally to go one-on-one -on -one because Wally was like family to us. So it was me, my brother Simon, and my cousin Mick, and Wally. So Wally was like, I consider Wally family back in them days. So even if Wally wanted to have a go, like once I was with Wally on the oval, he had a fight with some fucking bloke, argument from different nationality, and Wally hit him with the tennis racket, and the guy picked Wally up. Wally's a big boy, if anyone knows Wally, Wally Armand's a fucking tank, and he could fight too. He's a fucking monster. But this other Nasha was a big cunt too. Tackled him, picked him up, and while he's hitting him with the fucking racket, I've just come from side on, fucking whack, whack, just fucking laid into this cunt, grabbed anything I grabbed, just pumped this bloke with Wally. Again, everyone's fucking dirty. They're like, you're fucking dirty, can't you jump in? And the other nationality's like, we're not fucking having this. Because the guy my brother punched on with wasn't from a big Nasha. You know, I'm not gonna sit in knock fucking nationalities because i've got friends in all nationalities but this one one particular nationality they don't stand together in jail so it was easy to jump in that one because they don't stand together so it was easy to pump this bloke but these other nationalities fucking they stick together all day so they're all fuming they're like fuck this can't they're yelling out to me from the fucking windows fuck you you fucking dirty cunt it's on when you get out of the ground i'm like yeah 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 talking to ollie god rest his soul through the like little gaps i'm like oi there's some fucking big cunts in that unit, bro. I said, and I can't get a knife when I get out of here because all the boys are dirty on me anyway. Even my cousin Mick was upset with me. They're going to make me go one-on-one -on -one with the biggest cunt from the other Nasha. So, bro, what do I fucking do? And he's laughing and he's like, don't worry, I'm with you at this day to make a distant talk. And Wally was hard as cunt. Like, balls will fucking steal the bloke. Like, not afraid of no one, you know what I mean? Like, when I watched his murder on a security camera, it was circling, you could even see, like, he fucking jumps up. He gets shot multiple times. You could just tell he's a man's man. Like, you know what I mean? If you watch the video properly, he puts his finger up. I've zoomed in on that video a thousand times because I used to love Wally dearly. So he puts his finger up and he recites the Quran and he does his... It's, it's hard to explain in English. It's like he, he, he shared it. Like, it's like, before we die, we say that. And he'd done that. So that shows the type of bloke he was. He knew he was dying and he fucking recited it. So he's a fucking man's man. I don't give a fuck what he can't say. He's a man's man. And I knew him better than anyone knew him. Spent many years with him so I can comfortably sit and talk about the bloke because he was one of us at a particular time in his life. Back in the DCM nightclub days. We partied together. We had drums together. We fucking rode together. He had Abraham tattooed on his hand. He was one of us. So anyway, fucking, I'm saying to Wally, I just talk openly to Wally. I'm like, listen, bruh, I need to fuck get a knife. I'm not getting bashed, bruh. This cunt's, and I, I knew which one they were going to get me to fight one on one. I'm like, bruh, he's a fucking boxer. This cunt's been training for fucking 20 years in here. I said, fucking, bro, I'm not fighting him without a blade, bruh. I need a knife. And he goes, oh, don't worry, I'm with you. As soon as we go, we attack him, we come back here. <laughs> I'm like, that's not a fucking plan, bruh. The fuck's that a fucking plan? You know, long story short, we end up going out in the unit, the like, old heads got involved. My cousin Mick spoke to a few boys. My cousin Mick's got power in jail. At that time, we were running the prisons at that time. Anyway, so they let it go and they go, no more fucking jumping into it. So I was like, fuck, bro, I hope there's no dramas. So I was telling everyone, listen, bro, if he's gonna do dramas, challenge three, four guys, that's three on three. I can't stand there and watch you fight. So how I used to get around it, if someone, like if my brother or my cousin or Wally had a drama with someone, I'd always make sure I instigated something with the guy standing next to that guy. So then it's two on two, three on three. We don't have to jump that guy. And I can't, I just can't stand there and watch these guys fight. So anyway, <clears throat> so that's that. I'll get back to these type of stories after. Let me get to Danny Karam. 
I can talk on this guy too, even though I didn't know him, but my cousin Sam told me a lot of stories about this bloke. And I met Mick Kanan, Waza, and those boys that were convicted of his murder. I met them in jail. I met Waza once on an intake. Seemed like a nice guy. We spoke, well, there the whole day in the cells. Spoke, good guy, not a bad bloke. Um, spoke, I know Mick Kanan pretty well because he used to always come down for court. And then I was always in, in and out of Segro. So I'd be in segregation, he would come down, I'd have a, have a laugh with him. So I, I knew Mick Kanan better than I knew the rest, but they're all good boys regardless. So anyway, i tell you the story about fucking um, Danny Karen. And this is a story my dad confirms because my dad was friends with Danny Karen, and my dad was the one who used to always try to stop the drums between Sam and Danny because they used to always clash. <clears throat> one time, fuck him, there was a drama at King's Cross. Daniel was going crazy. And there was tension between him and my cousin because of Louis Bayer. He had a drama of Louis Bayer. Louis Bayer was a part of... Louis Bayer was a part of my cousins. And so my cousin Sam was aligned to Louis Bayer. Louis Bayer was against Danny Karam. Long story short, Danny Karam, for weeks on, was coming into the cross. Like one time he came into the cross... And my dad used to have a, a legal gambling place. That's how he knows Danny. So my dad knew Danny pretty well. Danny would come down to Marrickville and he'd help my dad out. He knew my dad was Sam's uncle, but he liked my dad because my dad would like... Danny was a very heavy heroin user. He was always needing money. So my dad had a gambling place, would always slip him money. And Danny was always respectful of my dad. My dad was always respectful of Danny. And they used to get a horse, just, horse gambling together like the races. It was a big thing back then. So my dad would always go with Danny. And that. So my dad was friends with Danny. My dad still to this day talks good of Danny. I'll tell you straight out. So I can't sit here and talk shit about the bloke because I didn't know him personally. Even though I'm friends with, like, not the best of friends, but I'm friends with Mick Kanan and that. And they're convicted of his killing. So I don't really want to comment too much on either side of that. But I'll tell you, because everyone keeps asking me about the fight Sam had with Danny and what was Danny Karam like. Obviously, I was around people that were around him. So... I, I'm pretty familiar with the story. My father tells it how it is, and my cousin Sam used to tell it how it is. He used to say, Danny's a hard cunt. Staunch as fucking bloke, even though they didn't like each other. My cousin liked him. They had a fallen out because of drugs. Danny was a drug user, and he just used to turn on people. But other than that, apparently he wasn't a bad bloke. And then stories came out that Danny was killing Muslims in Lebanon. So my cousin Sam got to be put off him a little bit, and... Yeah, my dad doesn't believe it. He goes, because he's never seen anything racist. He heard a lot of stuff. My dad goes, he used to hear Danny was racist about Muslims and that. But Danny never crossed the line in my dad. Because even my father, even though he's not a gangster, but he's still got mentality of Lebanon, he'll fucking pull a gun and shoot you. <laughs> my dad's the type of guy who fuck around, pull a knife out, or he'll go grab a gun and fucking blow your fucking head off. So Danny was familiar with my father from Lebanon. So he knows my dad's not, my dad's not a criminal, but he's not a pushover guy. So, Danny was always respectful. My dad told him one day, Danny walks into King's Cross. Apparently, Danny said to my dad, before he went to the cross, Sam's too much, too much. He's telling my dad that. My dad's trying to calm him down. He's like, listen, he's my fucking, he's like my son. And Sam was living with us at the time. So, Sam was living with my mum and dad, us as kids. And he was working for Louis Bayer as a bodyguard, whatever the fuck he was doing. I'm not too sure. But Sam was still living with us. So, my dad saying to Danny, you can't do that. He's my fucking, like my son. Sam was a fucking warrior too. So anyway, Danny Karam walks into King's Cross and Sam's Ferrari was parked on the strip. Everyone knows this fucking story from back in the day. So everyone, all the oldies who watch this will say 100% this cunt's telling the truth. Danny Karam fucking went, pulled the stop sign out of the fucking floor and threw it through my cousin's Ferrari window. Literally broke the stop sign. Oh, it was a stop sign or a bus sign. It was one of them signs. Kept back and forth, back and forth, broke it and threw it through my cousin's Ferrari window. My cousin was downstairs in EP1. Didn't know what the fuck was going on. Long story short, Danny leaves. My cousin comes up, finds out what's going on. Him and fucking Danny, that I think it was the next night, Danny's in the cross. I couldn't see him fucking attacks him. They go one-on-one. -on -one. Everyone records it was the best fucking fight they've ever seen. They smacked it out for fucking... I don't know how long. But everyone says it was a fucking mad fight. And no one. It was... Sam's a fucking hard cunt too. 
Sam's fingers are that fucking fat. He's a fucking giant. He's small, but he's fucking like built like ox. And he's a 24 damn fucking monk or something. He used to fucking turn the fires off with his hands after family barbecues. And he could have been a monk, but he didn't want to travel because he was looking after his mum. So Sam was a fucking warrior. And Danny was a warrior. And I asked Sam numerous times, who won that fight? And he goes, it was a good fight. He goes, it doesn't matter. He's dead now. I'm not going to talk about him. That's what Sam doesn't talk about dead people. He's always had that respect. But he goes, it was a good fight. And keep in mind, my cousin Sam once grabbed the German Shepherd that was biting one of the rellos <laughs> and broke its fucking mouth. <laughs> I swear to God. To get its teeth, to get it stopped biting one of the rellos, he opened its mouth and fucking ripped its mouth up, ripped its whole fucking face apart of his hands. Like Sam was tough as fuck. He hit someone with a fucking uh, motorcycle helmet. He's broken numerous motorcycle helmets, hitting cunts with their helmets still on. That's how hard he could hit. So him and Danny had a fucking crack and it was apparently uh, a full on crack. And then I think a week later, Danny was in the cross and Danny got shot in his legs. I never asked if it was Sam or not. I don't know. I never asked my cousin. But apparently Daniel was sitting in front of fucking one of the nightclubs, still running his mouth at my cousin, saying he's gonna do this and that. I don't know the situation. I've never asked Sam, I put this clearly, I've never asked Sam what happened there, but apparently someone rocked up and shot Danny in his legs. I don't know who it was, but it was in the middle of King's Cross. And then fucking apparently Danny ended up leaving the cross and starting his own crew, DK boys, and then I don't know what happened with them. Apparently they killed him, I'm not sure. They're being all found guilty of it. I'm not sure. I've never asked them whether they're guilty or innocent. I don't know. But he dies unrelated to my cousin Sam. Even though him and Sam had dramas and Danny was kneecapped. I don't know. Rumors say he had something to do with my cousin when he got kneecapped in the cross. And they have their little tit for tat. But when Danny died, it had nothing to do with my cousin Sam. That was his own crew or something. I'm not sure to the truth. So I can't comment on it. <clears throat> but Danny Karen used to get, my dad used to tell me, he used to ask him these stories about Danny and Sam, so I'm just answering what he's asking. I tell you the story about Danny Karen. My dad reckons that, like, they'll be hanging out, and then Danny would say to my dad, my dad used to always carry the yellow pages in his car, because he used to get lost, he used to go from race horses to race horses, he used to always have the yellow pages, and my dad used to drive, Danny never run around, and he used to go big gambling places. So Danny would always rip my dad's fucking yellow pages and my dad would be spewing it to get my new ones. One time, Danny was off his fucking face. Pat. My dad goes, he was heavily on the heroin, fucking off his guts. He goes, I don't know what was going on. But he grabbed two yellow pages. Do you know how hard it is to rip just one yellow page? My dad swears on everything. He goes, he had two yellow pages and ripped them in half. That's how strong the cut was. Even in Long Bay, he fucking, was it Long, yeah, Long Bay or Goldman? I don't know what jail it was. But he used to shin kick the fucking patio that like shelters people from rain. He was in there for fucking six years at the mid through his sentence because he used to always kick it every day. He broke the whole fucking awning down. So the cut was hard as nails. There's some weights in there still to now. That's got DK on the weights in Long Bay. Because he donated them or something. So it was a fucking hard cunt, that's for sure. He was no fucking weak cunt. So what else did you want to ask me? He's asked me something else, let me think. Oh. He's asked me what it felt like just to ride into King's Cross later in the pack. I'll tell you what. For years, I'd ride into King's Cross behind my cousins. So I was young, so it would be my cousins, all the high ranks, and then us younger boys all at the back. And that was even fun. But in the years to come, when we took over, my cousin retired and we took the the ranks we used to ride in there i swear to god with fucking 100 boys at the front me and my brother that feeling money can't buy i tell you i miss that feeling every day that's the only thing i miss out of the gang life is riding in my colors and riding in a pack fuck i miss it i tell you straight out riding in a pack i miss you know <clears throat> but I'm not going to rave on and on and on. I could continue on from story to story. I'm going to cut it. So then I've got more stories for you to answer. <clears throat> so keep it going for you until I figure out where this podcast is going. If I get a co-host. I've got mixed my co-host, but I just don't know when he's going to join me because his kid's been a bit sick and he's busy renovating a few shops. But he's my co-host. But in the meantime, I might bring guests on. People might ring me. But my permanent host is Mick Rooney. He's my permanent host.
and he's my best mate. So that's that. So for now, I'll just keep it like this. I hope you've loved it, and peace out. <laughs>